want to let you know I'm really excited to be here at uh, the first TEDx Cleveland event and uh, to be up on stage to uh, share the story of uh, the NPower technology and uh, my company, Tremont Electric. The beginning of uh, the story of the NPower technology uh, originally happened um, in um, 1996 uh, when I was a uh, junior in the College of Engineering at the University of Toledo studying mechanical and biomedical engineering. Uh, <laughs> go Rockets. <laughs> Uh, so after a, uh, a fantastic spring break down in Florida, um, I decided um, I needed to take the uh, next semester in the summer off. And uh, with that, I, I went ahead and um, <laughs> it, it was a very successful uh, quarter two, probably the best one that I had and figured, you know, if you're going to go out, go out on a high note. So I um, went ahead and uh, called back and uh, canceled all my classes with the understanding that by the time that uh, I got back home, my tuition check, which of course my mother had paid for, uh, was going to be in the mailbox and I'd be able to cash that check and uh, go and buy all the backpacking equipment that I needed. So uh, with uh, roughly about, um, what was it, about uh, three days of planning time, um, I headed down to uh, the beginning of the Appalachian Trail in Springer Mountain, Georgia. And I uh, had a, um, a girlfriend at the time drop me off uh, essentially in the middle of nowhere, uh, in the middle of the night on Easter Sunday so that um, I could uh, dedicate my summer and uh, spring and summer to backpacking on the Appalachian Trail. So I like to say that, you know, when you're backpacking 1,500 miles, you have a lot of time to think. Um, being, uh, being out there and backpacking, uh, the one thing that I was really thinking about was this 40-pound backpack that I had on. And, you know, when, it, when, you, when you do something like this, backpacking becomes your job. So all day long, I'm carrying this backpack, and I'm thinking, I've got a lot of shoulder strain. I'm getting these saddle sores on my hips. You know, mechanical and biomedical engineer in me kicks in and essentially says, okay, um, I've got 40 pounds of kinetic energy, and I keep on stopping into towns to buy batteries. <laughs> so I knew I needed to convert kinetic energy into electrical energy. And uh, with that, um, I, I had the initial brainchild for the NPower personal energy generator. We call it the PEG. Um, and the PEG allows us to be able to harvest human kinetic energy or human walking motion. And uh, with that, we're able to recharge your mobile electronic devices. This is alternative energy for the everyday person. Uh, this allows us to uh, use our multifunction devices in a way um, that everybody markets them to us as. Um, it, you know, uh, they, they want us to be able to use our devices uh, 8 or 10 or 12 hours a day, but the batteries only last about 4 or 5. Now, this is an ideal solution for people that, that walk around um, or move or commute um, and, and allows you to be able to create your own alternative energy. So, a after uh, getting back from the trail in 1996, you know, being just an engineering student, I went ahead and made some prototypes of uh, something that I thought would work. And of course, they were all a uh, stunning failure. Um, but I was able to get a few data points from those prototypes, and uh, that, that, that really allowed me to put my mind on the problem. And I continued to keep my mind on the problem for over 10 years. Uh, and it was 10 years of thought experiments. Why didn't those initial prototypes work? What do I need to add? What needs to be different here? And um, you know, it, it took that full 10 years to be able to come up with the uh, unique combination of technologies that were really going to allow this thing to work. And um, you know, at that time, the, the, the purpose in mind was creating mobile power. Uh, it also you know, sort of helped that you know, in, in 1996, people were still talking on the Zach Morris telephones. <laughs> and, uh, and, and now, you know, 2006, you know, we're starting to get iPods and iPhones and all these devices that are out there. So with that, um, uh, I decided to start Tremont Electric. And I talked to my wife and said, you know, um, listen, honey, I, I think I've got a really good idea. I'd like to shut down my consultancy. Um, I'd like to empty out our savings account and give that to the patent attorney. Um, I don't know when I'm going to have a paycheck again, um, but uh, I think this alternative energy area is going to get pretty big. And um, I, I'm glad that you know, we're really seeing the, the market uh, evolve. And uh, I'm also very happy that uh, last month I received my first paycheck since 2006. <laughs> <laughs> so this was our starting blocks, the first laboratory. You know, people talk about, you know, garage enterprises. I, I live in Tremont, and we don't have a garage. Um, so where do you go? You, go? you go into the basement of a house that was built in 1860. 
So, uh, you know, from consulting for Fortune 500 companies, this is, uh, this is where I ended up. And, um, you know, basic laboratory equipment gave me the tools that I needed to be able to mature the technology to a point where I could sit down with my wife, who is also in charge of marketing for Tremont Electric, and uh, she could teach me how to um, talk about the technology to people. So my ability to be able to stand up here uh, today and, and explain what it is that we're working on is owed uh, mostly to uh, Jill Lemieux. So thank you, honey. So uh, here we are in, uh, when was this, uh, 2009 last summer, we're, we're, we're finally um, starting to um, be able to get our product out there and we're able to talk about it and condense it into something that, that's sellable. Um, and uh, you know, this summer I, I ended up uh, getting the cover of Inside Business and uh, also the centerfold too. And I assure, you, <laughs> I assure you, being a centerfold model, they did not teach me in engineering school. Uh, one, one of the other funnier parts about this is uh, th this is uh, the corrected version. Um, uh, you can see it says uh, from seeing green from Aaron Lemieux. Uh, the print version um, they actually renamed me as Eric Lemieux. <laughs> so thought that was kind of interesting. Uh, here's our first real office, um, which is uh, down in Tremont, right on Professor Street. Uh, we're conveniently located next to uh, Edison's bar. Um, <laughs> I guess uh, from, from being an inventor, you know, uh, having Thomas Edison as your neighbor uh, is a very good thing, but it's even better when he sells beer. <laughs> so here we are with the NPower Peg, uh, and uh, we're presently uh, right before uh, product release. Um, you know, uh, we expect to be in the marketplace in spring of this year. Um, as with everything, uh, especially in an early stage enterprise, things take longer than you expect. Um, but uh, we're, we're just about there. Uh, I know that uh, there's a lot of people, uh, perhaps a lot of people in the audience that um, you know, pre-ordered the device and, and it's gonna be out there. Uh, we're working as quickly as we possibly can. Uh, that recession also kind of slowed things down too. Uh, with the personal energy generator, you know, we, we understand that there's lots of different markets. There's lots of different needs. This isn't just alternative energy. This is mobile power generation. Um, so there are no consumables that go along with this, so we don't have to worry about logistics or supply chain management to deal with. It's a self-contained device. We expect it to last between you know, three and four years, and um, the thing just, just eternally runs um, and creates the electrical power that we need. So of course, you know, um, we've been talking to the United States military, and we'd like to be able to get this product uh, into the hands of um, you know, uh, the uh, American warfighter. So we've, we've gone from coming up with a personal energy generator to acknowledging that we don't just have a personal energy generator, we own the patent for an alternative energy generating technology, um, which is you know, what the end goal originally was, but, but it's really sort of morphed into something else at this point. And we, we understand that you know, um, we, we need to start relying on alternative energies um, to uh, be able to uh, deal with energy independence and also with global warming. Uh, and of course, there's always technical people around, so I thought I'd throw that up so they could chew on it. All right, um, alternative energy is energy harvesting. And we know that uh, wind power, you know, people use turbines, and uh, solar power, solar, uh, photovoltaics. Um, end power allows us to be able to harvest um, oscillatory motions, or, or things in nature that go up and down, side to side, or back and forth. This is a drastically different type of technology, and, and, and we're actively applying it in, in many different areas. So, you know, we had to go to the big question, you know. What if we were able to find a natural power source? What about Lake Erie? And what if we could scale this technology up to create grid-scale alternative energy here in northeastern Ohio? And the answer is we can. So what we have is a device called a wave energy converter. Now a wave energy converter is a, is a buoy-like device which would be out in Lake Erie and instead of harvesting human walking motion, it harvests the wave energy of the waves as they go past the devices. Uh, something like this would be roughly um, eight feet in diameter and about 20 feet long and would only have a very small amount sitting above the water line. So with that, we put together a Great Lakes Wave Energy Converter Project. Each one of our buoys would create uh, 50 kilowatts of power um, and uh, we'd like to deploy a 40 
uh, Weck Farm out in Lake Erie, uh, out, out by the horizon, or uh, three to five miles out. Uh, and we would be able to power up to you know, 2,000 uh, homes in northeastern Ohio off of the wave energy that's naturally around us in Lake Erie. Now, the kicker here is that our goal is also to meet the price of coal-fired power, which is a very, very big goal for an alternative energy technology. However, um, we know from lots of different studies that harnessing wave energy is going to be one of the most cost-efficient ways of creating alternative energy. Um, when you think about it, we know that uh, water is 1,000 times more dense than air, which means it has an energy content that's roughly 1,000 times greater. When we're dealing with wave energy, we view it as concentrated wind power, but nature does all the work for us. And of course, uh, here's a depiction of what our uh, wave energy farm would look like. Um, just, uh, well, you can tell it's Lake Erie because we put some walleye in that picture, too. <laughs> um, so getting into this, you know, we know that this is going to be difficult. Uh, disruptive technologies are always difficult. You know, we've learned a lot of lessons of uh, bringing the peg to the marketplace. Um, and, and we know that there's, there's always critics of new technologies and new methods that are out there. And, and, and speaking to the educational part of TED, you know, what I wanted to do was at least roll through one example. And, and, and that example of bringing a new technology out and what inventors and innovators really encounter in this world um, it, it can be packaged pretty well into the story of the telephone. Uh, the telephone in the IP community is known as one of the world's most valuable patents. Uh, but the telephone had many, many critics when it started off. Alexander Graham Bell was told people don't want to talk to each other. <laughs> They'd prefer to receive text messages. And that's what text messaging was at the time. We all know that text messaging is very, very common these days. And I think he'd be getting a kick out of it because people are actually using their telephones to text message these days. So the point of the story is that you know, there's always going to be critics. Um, there's always going to be you know, people saying, well, you know, a wave energy converter farm in Lake Erie doesn't make any sense because people receive, prefer to receive text messages. And being an innovator, um, part of my job to bring new technology out into the marketplace is to not listen to these people on quite a few occasions. You know, when you, when you, you think about the telephone example, um, you, there was a grain of truth in what, what the critics had said. The grain of truth was people refer to, prefer to receive text messages. And yes, there's a certain segment of the population these days that does. But it took 100 years for that to come true. So if you just took it on face value, there's logic to it, it makes sense, but its time is not in the right place. Part of being an innovator, part of thinking out ahead of everybody is understanding that there are some jumps that you have to make and you just have to go for them. Now, I spoke a lot about the Appalachian Trail. <laughs> Good old uh, Gov Governor Sanford here, um, you know, uh, it sort of uh, brought the Appalachian Trail to the forefront in spring of this year. We all kind of know that story. Um, and, and I did actually backpack on the Appalachian Trail. I've got lots of records and lots of pictures to prove it, so not wasting time. I was out there and I, I, I didn't fly to Argentina. <laughs> One thing that I did learn is that it's not polite to say Appalachian Trail to a governor during a press conference. <laughs> <laughs> all right. It, and with that, that's uh, the end of my presentation. And um, you know, this is a picture of uh, Mount Katahdin, uh, which is the northern terminus of the Appalachian Trail. Uh, one place that uh, I've been on, on a very temporary visit. Um, you know, um, my story of backpacking on the Appalachian Trail was 1,500 miles. Uh, the Appalachian Trail is over 2,000 miles. So I certainly left myself 500 miles for retirement. <laughs> I'm Aaron Lemieux. Thank you very much.